Welcome to lesson 2 in module 2 uh, which looks at the structure of atoms and periodic properties and this lesson which is podcast 1 focuses on light and quantum theory and the Bohr atomic model. Now readings for this topic is found in uh, chapter 2 of the textbook. Now in our last lecture or in our first lecture uh, in, in, the, in the module we basically looked at uh, what we describe as the classical views of the atom. Uh, we started out with looking at the Thomson's model and then we showed that the Thomson's model is replaced by Rutherford's model which basically shows that the the atom is composed of a nucleus uh, that is at the center and there are electrons which are negatively charged particles that are surrounding or orbiting the nucleus at specific distances from the nucleus. And so we ended by asking the question, what is a major shortcoming of Rutherford's, atom Rutherford's atomic model? And the, the, the bottom line is that there is no experimental evidence that indicates that the electrons orbit the nucleus at any specified distance from the nucleus. Certainly there is no dispute about where the, the nucleus is based on the gold foil experiments but the gold foil experiments did not tell us or any other experiment did not tell us uh, that Rutherford actually performed didn't tell us exactly where that electron is around the nucleus. It didn't tell us that the electron was orbiting the nucleus at a particular distance from the nucleus. And so in order for us to be able to understand exactly where the electron is around the nucleus we have to then uh, study some of the properties uh, that it is that the electron has. And the first thing that we know, particularly from the cathode ray ex uh, tube experiments, is that light is emitted, uh, uh, or the electrons, uh, ex you know, shone as light outside of the nucleus. And this tell us that, tells us that light, uh, or the electron, behaves as light. And, uh, and is a form of electromagnetic radiation, or it has electromagnetic properties. And so, in this lesson, we want to explore the behavior of light as a wave and use our understanding of the wave-like properties of the electron to build a theory called the quantum theory, which is going to be the basis for uh, understanding uh, where it is uh, or building a model of the, of the, of the structure of an atom, uh, 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 which basically will pinpoint more definitively where it is that the electron is around the nucleus. And so these are the objectives that you should be able to uh, actually pinpoint uh, at the end of this lecture. But in a nutshell, uh, what they speak to is that we're going to study the properties of the electron as a wave and use that understanding of, a, of, 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 of the of, of electromagnetic radiation, uh, which an electron behaves like, uh, to understand or to build this idea of a quantum theory and link that uh, to a model which is called the Bohr atomic model. So, as we said before, the in, light behaves as a wave. What is a wave? A wave is a progressive repeating disturbance uh, that spreads through a medium from a point of origin to more distant points. And so we have various, we're familiar with various types of waves, various examples of waves, uh, which include water waves, earthquake waves, sound waves, and very importantly, electromagnetic wave, uh, which is uh, what light is. Here is a, a, a depiction of um, a, a, a string that is fixed to two ends, and uh, the string is vibrating uh, in different, uh, showing different modes of vibration, and uh, and so what we want to do now is to actually understand what these different modes of vibration are and how they are related to the wave-like properties that the wave has itself. And so we need to understand the characteristics of waves. Uh, here we have uh, a, a basic wave motion, which essentially is a sine sinusoidal. Uh, uh, curve uh, which has uh, the movement of the curve such that you have peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs uh, that travel along a particular direction along a particular axis and uh, and there are certain characteristics that the, waves ha the wave has. One, it has a wavelength 
the wavelength is essentially equal to uh, the distance between uh, two crests or consecutive identical points. So, for so so two crests. Uh, these two crests are consecutive identical points and the distance between there and there is a wavelength. We could also look at two troughs again uh, that is the, the wavelength and we can also look at other parts of the wave for example this point here is identical to that point there and it's equivalent to the wavelength. We can also say that uh, this point here is identical to that point there and is equal to the wavelength. Another characteristic or property, characteristic I should say, is the amplitude. And the amplitude is the maximum uh, displacement from the zero line uh, that the wave has. So it's the height of a peak or the height of a, tr a trough. And this property is going to be very critical in understanding what is the result when two waves uh, essentially interact with each other. And then we have the frequency, which is new. Uh, are denoted by nu. Nu here is the Greek uh, is a Greek letter, and uh, is it is the number of wave crests or troughs that pass over the origin every second. So if we use this as the origin, uh, it is the number of peaks right that pass through this point uh, within a second, and it basically speaks to the speed of the wave. <coughs> Let us look at. Uh, uh, two different waves that move at two different spe speeds or uh, at a low frequency and a higher frequency. Uh, here we have um, within one second uh, two peaks basically passing through or one wavelength or one cycle of a wavelength passing passing within one second. Uh, and then in another, another case again still within the same second uh, we have now two uh, wavelengths basically passing within that second. And so we have here two cycles of wavelength uh, which indicates to us that uh, within one second we have two wavelengths uh, and within uh, one second here we have one wavelength, lower frequency, higher frequency. And this essentially uh, shows us in particular that as frequency is increasing the wavelength decreases because the distance between here and here is, is equal to uh, sorry, is lower than the distance between here and here, still within the same one second. And if we were to actually have three cycles or four cycles within the one second, we would have a much higher frequency and the wavelength would be much smaller. So, we, we, so, 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 so just to, 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 to make a correlation here, that frequency is related to wavelength or is in fact inversely direct or in fact inversely are uh, related to wavelength. That is to say, as frequency increases, we see that uh, wavelength decreases, and uh, and also the speed of the wave increases with frequency. And this is an important property that we will e eventually utilize in building this quantum theory. Now, consider we have two waves, two identical waves, and we bring them to interact with each other. By identical waves we mean that they have the same frequency, they have the same wavelength, they have the same amplitude. Right? All three basic characteristics of the waves these two identical waves have. And we bring them into each other in such a way that they are in phase. Meaning that we, we, we allow them to interact such that a peak interacts with a peak, a trough interacts with a trough, a uh, peak interacts with a peak and a trough interacts with a trough. And since they're moving at the same speed, uh, they have the same height, the resultant is described as what we describe as constructive interference where there's addition of the peak. And the resultant is a more uh, enhanced peak where the amplitude increases um, uh, but the speed of the wave remains the same and the uh, wavelength remains the same but the amplitude increases uh, and this amplitude is related to intensity which we'll see essentially uh, as we look at some more properties of a wave. And so when the waves are in phase we have constructive interference uh, we have amplification of the wave and then we have another case where again the same identical waves but they're out of phase meaning that uh, a, 
uh, a trough interacts with a peak and a peak interacts with a trough uh, and what happens is that there is cancellation of the wave all right and we have zero amplitude as shown here and so this is called destructive interference uh, so when two waves interact uh, whether they are uh, identical or whether they are not identical but we just used identical here just for simplification when two waves interact they essentially give rise to constructive interference and destructive interference constructive interference is where you have an amplification of the wave the wave gets gets taller uh, and destructive interference means that there's complete cancellation of the wave all right that here we have a, a, a nice depiction of what that is here we have two waves this gray wave moving uh, along this direction and or sorry moving in the moving towards the left right we have this gray wave moving towards the left and then we have this yellow wave moving towards the right and notice what happens when two peaks overlap at this point two peaks overlap we have a uh, maximization or uh, the, the amplitude becomes greater of the resultant wave uh, is uh, showing uh, a maxima that is much higher or an amplitude that is greater. The, 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 the resultant wave is the pink wave. And watch when uh, a peak in o overlaps with a trough as right now we have a flattening of the pink peak or the resultant, sorry, the resultant wave which tells us that we have destructive interference. So this is essentially showing us that we have constructive interference when peaks overlap with peaks and destructive interference when peaks overlap with troughs and the important thing that we need to get from this is that the interference of waves is a property that is exhibited only by waves we all have seen interference of waves in real life here is a, a depiction of something that we may have seen before um, uh, consider these two buddies fishing uh, and they have the same fishing rod uh, the same bait at the end of the fishing rod and they throw out their fishing rods at the same time and uh, also consider that the, the lake has no other source of disturbance it's completely dead All right. what happens is the formation of uh, various ripples uh, at the starting from the point of contact of the bait with the water and so here we have this body on the le on, uh, down, uh, on the lower side uh, his bait or the, 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 the bait interacting with the water at the point of contact with the water produces ripples which basically um, emanate from the center and become larger and larger and larger and larger and spread out and the same thing happens with his friend and what happens now when we have the waves from both sources interacting we have points which are shown by the bright uh, the, the lighter color uh, which are points of enhancement or points where we have the result of an increase in the amplitude all right this essentially is indicating uh, constructive interference and then we have points where there is zero displacement or zero amplitude it's flat and these points are points of destructive interference and so here we show that the interference of waves is a, pro uh, is, is a property of wave uh, and we're going to look at how it is that the interference of waves uh, basically uh, uh, as, as well as other properties of waves basically give us more information about the way in which the electron behaves now electromagnetic waves is another form of wave and since light behaves as uh, light is, an is a form of electromagnetic wave you need to understand some characteristics of the electromagnetic wave uh, this type of wave originates from the movement of electric charges and uh, we should know uh, those of us who have actually done some physics should know that the movement of an electric charge or an electric particle or I should say a charged particle but an electric charge basically results in the generation of a magnetic field and an electric field and so in an electromagnetic wave uh, you have the movement of an electric charge and that electric charge uh, basically results in uh, oscillations and fluctuations in both an electric and magnetic field and these two uh, fields uh, which are oscillating as a wave 
uh, are propagated over a particular distance. So here is a depiction of what an electromagnetic wave would look like. We have uh, uh, the we have one plane here, the vertical plane, which is mapped out by the the, the the pink color, and along that plane we have a wave moving in a particular direction. And uh, this wave here is representing the vibration of the magnetic component of the electromagnetic radiation. And then we have uh, perpendicular to that plane and to that wave uh, another plane, right? And along that plane, which is here in blue, we have the, this wave here uh, being propagated uh, over uh, the distance in that in the same direction of motion, but perpendicular. And this uh, 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 vibration or this wave essentially is the electric vibration or the electric field. Now the important thing about uh, an electromagnetic wave or any wave in particular is that the movement, the propagation of the wave over a particular distance allows for the transfer of energy uh, through empty space or through any medium that the wave is passing through. And uh, in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, we have basically uh, various um, kinds sorry in terms of the electromagnetic wave we have various kinds of electromagnetic waves which basically uh, form what we describe as an electromagnetic spectrum which essentially is a, an array or a range of waves or electromagnetic waves of different wavelengths and different frequencies and here we have a depiction of what that is the electromagnetic spectrum is essentially the spectrum that uh, of, 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 of radiation or uh, EM waves that we get, EM meaning electromagnetic, uh, that we get from the sun. So the, the source of origin of the EM spectrum is the sun. And the sun basically produces a range of, 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 of waves or a range of radiation that have uh, specific or different values or different frequencies and different wavelengths. And here we have uh, in this diagram here a depiction of that. We start out with uh, the longest wavelength waves which are called radio waves uh, and we see that the frequency is in the order of 10 to the 7. And then as, we, as the wavelength becomes smaller we then uh, uh, have the microwaves uh, which are around one centimeter and we see that the frequency is increasing we then move on to the infrared <coughs> excuse me we move on to the infrared w uh, radiation where those waves uh, have a wavelength of a hundred micrometers and we see that the frequency increases to 10 to the 13 then we come to the visible uh, uh, radiation and the visible radiation is what allows us to be able to see um, and is in fact what we see we see visible radiation and, we, and the visible radiation allows us to see objects around us and th those wavelengths are uh, just under one micrometer and we see that the frequency is around 10 to the 15 and then we move on to the ultraviolet radiation uh, which has uh, wavelength values of around 10 nanometers and um, the frequency values are around 10 to the 17 then we move on to x-rays which are much smaller and then gamma rays which are even smaller around 1 picometer and the frequencies are 10 to the 21 so what we we can see here is that there are, again we are establishing the relationship between wavelength and frequency uh, as the wavelength is decreasing we are seeing that the frequency is increasing and that relationship is captured in this equation here frequency nu is equal to c over lambda where c is the speed of light all right uh, we're using a constant now what we also see is that uh, because we're talking about a wave and, we're, and in particular here an em wave we have the the wave the movement of the wave actually results in the transfer of energy and so essentially we can correlate the wavelength of the wave or the frequency of the wave with respect to the energy and the energy of the wave is essentially equal to E uh, which is equal to HC over lambda where H is Planck's constant C is the speed of light and uh, that is over the wavelength and it's also equal to H nu which is 
uh, h times the frequency, knowing us knowing that uh, nu is equal to 1 over uh, the lambda or is equal to c over lambda. And so we can basically see that there is, a, there is a direct relationship of the energy with frequency and an inverse relationship of energy with our wavelength. And so what we're showing here is that as we're moving from uh, long wavelength to short wavelength, right? we have the increase in energy and the increase in frequency. And let us spend some time to look at the visible spectrum because we're more concerned now with the visible spectrum because light is, uh, is, is, is a visible radiation. And uh, we see here that in the visible range of the electromagnetic spectrum, we have uh, a range of colors that are associated with uh, um, the movement from uh, uh, longer wavelength to shorter wavelength, right? From 740 nanometers to 390 nanometers. And this region or this range of wavelengths is regarded as the visible range or the visible spectrum uh, where we're moving from uh, uh, red through to yellow through to green to blue to purple. And one can envisage that if we're increasing, decreasing uh, in wavelength, it means that the frequency values, uh, or should I should say, the frequent yes, the frequency of a red uh, color, uh, or the waves associated with a red color, is actually lower than the frequency uh, associated with waves that uh, that are of um, or give rise to a purple color. Okay. So we spoke of uh, interference which is a property that is inherent of waves, um, we want to actually explore uh, evidence for the interference of waves. And, we can exp and, 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 and one experiment that, it, that does that is called the Young's Double Slit Experiment. And it's a very simple um, experiment that some of us would have probably done at high school uh, if you had the opportunity to. And really, what we're what this experiment allows us to, to study is eff effectively a property called diffraction or the diffraction of light. All right. So what is this Young's double slit experiment? Well, this is a simplistic representation of what that is. Say that we're in a dark room, a very dark room, and we have a flashlight source which gives off white light. And then we put in front of the, the, the source of the flashlight a barrier that has two slits. What we see, and then we have, after the, the, the barrier with the two slits, uh, a screen which basically um, shows us that we have uh, light and dark bands. Right? We have these light bands that are interspersed uh, with dark bands. Um, what is this, what is the, why is it that we have these light and dark bands? Why don't we just have a, a bright uh, uh, array of light on the screen here? Um, no, the reason for this is because of interference. This is a depiction of what that is, of what, of, of what is going on. Here we have our light source, which is our flashlight, and we have and, 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 and the idea of diffraction, if we were to define what diffraction is, is that diffraction basically allows for a change in the direction of the wave uh, uh, as the wave passes an obstacle. And so if we consider these slits right, as points at which you have an obstacle, uh, or, or rather points that allow the wave to move out from the obstacle, uh, which is the barrier, right? then you will have a change in the direction of the wave. And the change in the direction of the wave will allow for two sources of waves now. And these two sources of waves, or the two slits will allow for uh, two sources of waves. And these two sources of waves, with their, slightly, with their waves slightly um, having their direction slightly altered, will ultimately interfere uh, or overlap uh, in either a constructive way or a destructive way to produce dark bands and light bands. And so here we have on the screen, we have light bands uh, and then dark bands, light bands, dark bands. Uh, the light bands are a result of constructive interference. Here we have points from each wave 
that are identical that essentially overlap with each other and then uh, in the case and here we have the same thing we have points along this, the same parts of the wave over, overlapping uh, in a constructive way to give uh, a light band and then we have destructive interference where we don't where we have overlapping but we don't have overlapping of identical parts of the waves and so that results in destructive interference and so we see that uh, in the du Young's double slit experiment that uh, we, 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 we get through the interaction interference of waves we have what we describe as a diffraction pattern or a diffraction grating which basically shows uh, light bands uh, consecutive light and dark bands uh, from the center uh, to both ends of the diffraction pattern. Another inherent property that light has is refraction. Refraction essentially occurs when light passing from one medium to another medium basically changes direction. And a very simple experiment, and some of us again may have carried out this experiment at high school in physics, uh, where we have a prism which is basically made out of glass or some other kind of material um, but it's transparent uh, what happens is that uh, if we pass a beam of light through that prism again if we're in a darkened room and we have a flashlight and we pass it through and we have a very narrow beam of light passing into the prism and if we actually now put a screen behind the prism we will see uh, something like this we will see uh, the white light splitting up into uh, bands of color and the bands of color are associated with the visible spectrum from red to yellow to green to blue and the reason for this uh, the, the observation of the light uh, or, or the bands of different colors is as a result of interaction or overlapping or interference of wavelengths of similar value uh, for the most part but there is a progressive change in the wavelength from uh, low, uh, high uh, wavelength from the red to the low wavelength to the purple. And so this is a, a, a very nice representation of that. And so we see that, uh, and so this is basically showing us the, 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 the showing us evidence for the visible spectrum. All right? At the visible spectrum, it's a spectrum of, of, of wavelengths uh, that allow for a continuous change in the wavelength. And again, this is an, uh, an example of the experiment that I would just uh, set up, that I, would, that I just described. We have, uh, because of the refraction of the light, we have a range of wavelengths that, that continuously change uh, from uh, low, higher wavelength or low energy, red, to uh, high energy or low wavelength purple and if you notice from this uh, depiction here uh, you see that the red wavelengths or the red waves I should say are less diffract uh, are less refracted than the purple waves or uh, the purple um, the purple uh, waves from the purple color all right and so this visible spectrum we call a continuous spectrum because we have a continuous range of wavelength from one end uh, of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum. <coughs> all right. So how does all of this relate to the atomic structure? We basically what we what I just did was to allow us to be able to have an idea as to how it is that light behaves um, and giving us evidence for the behavior of light. Essentially, what we're saying is that light um, uh, light is a wave is, is, has wave properties in which uh, so these wave properties are, are interference and refraction uh, interference which is the overlapping of waves uh, which result in light bands and uh, which is called destructive interference and uh, uh, and also the result uh, of dark bands which is as a result of destructive interference and then we also have said that uh, uh, refraction of light gives rise to a range of wavelength or a spectrum of wavelength. So consider what we know uh, and we're going to set up an experiment here where we have a light source uh, passing through a prism. We expect that there is a continuous spectrum that is produced. 
But say that we place in front of the light source or in between the light source and the prism uh, a jar of hydrogen gas. What we see is another kind of spectrum. A spectrum where we are seeing the progression of the, the spectrum from purple to red, but we're seeing that there are these dark lines in between some of these colors. And also, if we were to place another prism at an angle uh, from the jar of gas, but, it's not, but we're not collecting the beam that is passing through the gas, we get another kind of spectrum in which we have mostly dark bands, but we have lines of color. Uh, what is the difference between the continuous, this spectrum, which is a continuous spectrum, and these spectra, I'm using the word spectra because it's plural for spectrum, uh, we are seeing that in these spectra we have lines, and we call these spectra line spectra. And essentially what the line spectrum is, is that it's a discontinuous range of wavelengths, as opposed to uh, the continuous spectrum where there is a continuous range of wavelengths. And this is telling us that when we heat up a jar of hydrogen atoms or hydrogen molecules, uh, there are certain limited number of discrete wavelengths uh, that are available. Uh, right? And we want to essentially uh, ask what is the cause of the radiation uh, that produce what, what is the reason for the production of a line spectrum as opposed to the production of a continuous spectrum. Uh, in more specific terms, why does heating hydrogen produce light? Uh, or why does passing an electric current through a tube of hydrogen gas produce light? And we're going to look at that uh, by looking at this experiment here. If a sample of hydrogen gas is heated, it gives off light. When you view this light through a prism, you'll see an emission spectrum consisting of bright lines at specific frequencies. Because the spectral lines come at definite intervals, this suggests that specific energy levels <coughs> exist in the atom. A cross-section of an atom shows the energy levels similar to the rungs of a ladder. When energized, the electrons move temporarily to higher energy levels. As the electrons fall back to lower energy levels, they lose energy in the form of light, which produces the characteristic spectrum of the elements. Because we know that the emission spectrum for each element is different, we also know that the distances between energy levels must be different for every element. Right, so we're basically saying that when we heat up a, a jar of hydrogen gas, we basically are giving the electrons in the atoms energy. The electrons gain that energy and are promoted to a higher energy step, state or a higher energy level and then uh, they lose that energy and fall back to a lower energy state and the falling back process results in the, the em emission or the loss of energy and that loss of energy is, 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 is related to a specific frequency that we see in our spectrum right because we are seeing a line in the spectrum or a specific wavelength uh, of color uh, that we're seeing in the spectrum. All right, so here we have uh, a tube of hydrogen, uh, and we can actually think of these tubes like fluorescent bulbs. Fluorescent bulbs essentially have gas in them, and we basically pass an electric current through them, and they glow. Um, and, 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 and the glowing is because the electrons are losing the energy uh, that they initially got, uh, you know, got from the, from the current source and on losing that energy they give off light and so here we have a tube um, that is that has hydrogen in it and it's 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 connected to a power source and we turn on uh, the, the, the 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 power and when we pass this light through a prism okay and collect the image on a background we get band lines of different colors and these lines are related to specific values of wavelength 
associated with different colors or specific values of frequency. What does that what does a line spectrum of hydrogen tell us? All right? So each line in this spectrum again as I said before has a specific wavelength. Okay? Uh, and each wavelength or and, and also there's a specific frequency value. If you look at the the continuous spectrum, if we were to say if we were to look at the red line, we would say that that uh, wavelength is around 740. But between 740 and uh, the point at which we now have a blue bluish line, uh, I don't remember what color this is, this blue here, um, we then have another line that is around 400 or 500 nanometers. There is a region of dark bands, so there are no energies or no energy levels that are associated with these colors. And then we move on to the darker blue. And so we have another line that is around 450 nanometers. And so we have specific wavelength values and we have specific frequency values. And if you go back to our equation where E is equal to HC over lambda, it means that there are specific energy values that are associated. And if you consider the fact that the electrons gain energy are promoted to a higher energy st state or energy level and fall back and give off a particular amount of energy that is equivalent to uh, that has a specific wavelength and a specific frequency it tells us that there is a limited number of energy values available to the excited gaseous atoms and this difference between energy values uh, is equivalent to or is called the quantum of energy and is essentially the basis for what we describe as the quantum theory. What is this quantum theory? Well, we call it also the, 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 the quantum hypothesis. Uh, uh, it essentially tells us that the quantum of energy that is given off by the electron delta E when it falls back to a lower energy state is equal to Hc over lambda. Delta E uh, can be associated with energy absorbed uh, or energy emitted. And we will look at the difference between the spectra when we have energy absorbed and energy emitted a little later on. In the equation, we have H is Planck's constant and nu is frequency, and we know that frequency is related to the wavelength of the radiation. So it tells us that we have discrete or specific amounts of energy. For you to have delta E, you have to, have, you have to move from uh, E1 state to an E2 state or an E initial state to an E final state and that difference in those two energy states or energy values is equal to delta E and that delta E value is associated with uh, the wavelength and also the frequency of radiation. Now further evidence and so this idea of there being certain allowed energy states or energy changes or discrete or specific amounts of energy is called quantization, right? Discrete numbers of energy levels that are within our atom. And further evidence of this is uh, seen in the experiment describing the photoelectric effect, which is found in the textbook. Now, how do we show that the quantum of energy that is emitted uh, or given off by the electron as it falls back from a higher energy state to a lower energy state related to this idea of quantization? How do we know that there is a specific difference in energy or a specific uh, initial energy state and a specific final energy state that is equivalent to the delta E value or the quantum of energy that is given off? Uh, and how is that related to quantization? Quantization meaning that there are specific values of energy. There aren't any arbitrary values of energy. Well. Let us start out by exploring that by looking at the, uh, the Rutherford's model and why we're going to dispel the Rutherford's model here. We know what the Rutherford's model is. And if you consider that the electron is moving around the nucleus, if it is going to give off, um, if, it's going to be, uh, if it's going to lose energy, right, as it's moving from a higher energy state to a lower energy state, it is likely that the electron is going to be spiraling into the nucleus, right? And of course, that doesn't really happen. Okay? One, that doesn't happen. And two, if it were spiraling, it means that it is giving off a continuous amount of energy. You don't have e uh, specific energy values. You have 
a continuous change in energy state from one to another to another to another. There's a progressive decrease in the energy state as the electron is moving towards the nucleus. And so if that is to happen, then it, that would be equivalent to the production of uh, a continuous spectrum or uh, that is, for example, the light spectrum, the, 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 the visible spectrum, where we have a continuous change in wavelength. The continuous change in wavelength is associated to, with uh, a continuous change in the energy values. And since that doesn't really happen, this, this basically dispels Rutherford's model that uh, we in fact have the electron basically circl circling the orbit, circling the nucleus in a specific orbit. Okay. Now, the, the, the Rutherford's model is replaced by this other model called the Bohr's atomic model. And the Bohr's atomic, mo atomic model is based on this idea of quant a quantum of energy. The electron being in a higher energy state and moving to a specific energy state and giving off, and giving off a, a specific quantum of energy. Now, let us try to uh, see how it is that the quantum, uh, the quantum, uh, uh, quantum theory is essentially uh, associated with the Bohr's atomic model. How it is that we can use the quantum uh, uh, theory to uh, basically propose what this Bohr model is supposed to look like. All right, so the quantum model basically has two theories which are in combination. One, the Planck's theory, which says that delta E is equal to h nu over lambda, hc over lambda, or h nu. And also, uh, the, an Einstein understanding of the movement of a particle that has a particular mass. A particle that has a mass, which is the electron in this case, uh, that is moving, uh, has an angular momentum, particularly if we're considering it moving in an orbit. All right, and so this is a depiction of what that is. Uh, we have the center, and I guess this, this could be the nucleus, and we have the electron circling the nucleus in a particular orbit. Uh, anybody that is moving, any object that is moving, has a, a particular momentum. If you're moving in a straight line, you have a linear momentum. If you're moving in a circle or in an orbit, you have an angular momentum. And the, angular, and the momentum, essentially, is equal to the mass times the, velo the, the velocity. And if we're including angular momentum or the angular component of an electro of a particle, in this case an electron moving in an orbit, then we have to associate the we have to include the angle, which is theta, that is associated with the um, the axis or the, uh, the, the, the 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 axis that is associated with the orbit, right? Uh, and so angular momentum L is equal to the radius times the momentum or the linear momentum which is equal to r times mv sine theta uh, where p here is mv sine theta all right and what we're seeing that and and therefore that this means that if if an electron has a particular uh, uh, is moving in a in an orbit if it has another orbit or if it is able to move into another orbit then the angular momentum is going to change. And so, uh, if, if, for example, the electron, let me go back over that, if the, if the electron is moving in this orbit, right, and then it is supposed to move in another orbit, that is a bigger orbit, right, then it means that the angular momentum is going to change because the radius of that orbit is changing. And so, if the radius of that orbit is changing, then it means that angular momentum can only have specific values or is quantized. All right? Now, let us see what the relationship between Planck's hypothesis how Planck the relationship between Planck's hypothesis and Einstein's hypothesis of angular momentum basically show us quantization. Again, Planck's hypothesis delta E is equal to h nu which is equal to hc over lambda, which is equal to final energy minus initial energy. F initial en final energy state minus initial energy state. All right? Now, what is this energy? We know that energy, if, the, if a particle is moving, it has a particular kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy, Ek, is equal to half mv squared. But the electron is moving in an orbit, and so it doesn't have a linear kinetic energy. It has an angular uh, kinetic energy, if I, if I were to say that, or a kinetic energy that is associated with, this, with its angular movement or angular motion. And so we have to incorporate now what we describe as an angular velocity, which is omega, which is equal to v sine theta. And because the, the body is moving in a, in a circular, uh, in an orbit, it will have, uh, 
inertia associated with it, a mass moment of inertia. And so instead of using the actual mass, we have to now incorporate this idea of um, uh, inertia, which is equal to mR squared. And so our, our, our orbital kinetic energy, which is what the kinetic energy that the electron is moving in, because it's moving in an orbit, is now equal to Ek, which is half I omega squared not half mv squared because that is associated with linear movement of, 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 of a body. So, th so we know the kinetic energy is equal to half i omega squared. And then if we consider what Einstein says about angular momentum, angular momentum is equal to L which is equal to r times p which is equal to r times mv sine theta. And then we can actually incorporate this idea of mass moment of inertia into our equation and we're just playing around with it. We do, I don't want you to know all of this, by the way. I just want you to conceptually understand what we're going, getting at. Where the ma angular momentum now is equal to the product of the mass moment inertia of inertia and the angular velocity. And so if we combine both theories, Ek is equal to half I omega squared, we can now incorporate the angular momentum into the equation and, it turns, and, and then expand it. It turns out that Ek is equal to half rmv sine theta squared. And this is telling us that when we have a particular value or a particular orbit of, uh, distance from the nucleus, or if we have a particular orbit which is associated with a particular radius from the nucleus, uh, then there's a particular energy value. Or in other words, the energy is directly related to the distance r from the nucleus or the, the radius of the uh, orbit. And so if we're moving from, uh, and so we can have a, a situation where we have energy state 1, which is going to be directly related to uh, a radius 1, and we can have energy state 2, which is directly related to uh, radius 2, and we can have energy state 3, which is directly related to uh, our uh, radius 3, and so on. And so we're seeing that the energy is changing dependent on the radius. If the radius gets larger, uh, there is a direct relationship with the kinetic energy. And so if an electron is moving from one radius, R1, to another radius, uh, it's moving from a specific value of radius to another specific value of radius. That is quantization. And quantization is associated with the energy that the electron would have, uh, or the difference in energy that the electron would have uh, between both uh, uh, locations or both orbits, uh, which is equi equivalent to the delta E, which is a quantum of energy. And so here we see that uh, quantization, which is uh, the idea of having specific values of either energy, angular momentum, and radius, is an important uh, feature of uh, the energy state of uh, an, an electron in, in a hydrogen atom. And so, now, let me just go back here. Now, I don't need you to know this derivation or this derivation, right? I need for you to just have a conceptual understanding as to how it is that we are relating a quantum of energy to the idea of quantization, there being specific values of energy states or di specific distances that the electron is from the nucleus, all right? Now, it so turns out that, because of, since we know that uh, angular momentum has specific values, we can say that the angular momentum is quantized. And the angular momentum is equal to mv sine, mvr sine theta, which is also equal to hr over lambda, which now, the fact that we have lambda, we're incorporating the wave-like property of the electron. And that term here, this term here, is also equal to nh over 2 pi, where 2 pi is incorporating uh, um, the movement uh, within uh, uh, 360 degrees, all right, uh, which is essentially explaining to us an orbit. Now, this n here is basically what we describe as a principal quantum number, and it tells us that there are n whole num there there is a whole number of wavelengths that are of specific values. That is to say that the wavelength changes uh, by specific values. We don't have uh, a range of change of wavelength we have, the wavelength moving from one, one value to another value and to another value. And that is what we're basically seeing in our line spectrum. We're seeing definite wavelengths of color uh, uh, that we have uh, in this, uh, when we heat up this hydrogen atom. 
And so this this essentially then uh, allows us to uh, show that R, which is the radius that the electron would be moving through, uh, is equal to this 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 term here. And we can see that R is directly related to n, which is a which, which is a principal quantum number, which is specific values. And and so that means that there are only certain allowed orbits that the electron can uh, move to or from, right? And uh, this is basically the basis for uh, now uh, describing the fact that uh, we have our nucleus uh, and then the electron resides in specific or allowed orbits around the nucleus. And each orbit is equated to, uh, has a particular value of R, uh, but because we can't measure R directly, it is directly related to a partic particular quantum number n, which is a whole number, which is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. And the fact that we have no specific orbitals, sorry, specific orbits, right, tells us that we have quantization of distance of the electron from the nucleus. And this is the Bohr atomic model. Now what does that what does it tell us about the energy and how we can how can we find the energy that is associated with each orbit? Uh, we know that energy is quantized. <coughs> Excuse me. There are specific values of energy, uh, that is to say that the electron can occupy. So the electron is uh, and then that energy is equivalent to this term here. We see that energy again is is related to n, the principal quantum number. And if we were to reduce this equation or or, or find a uh, represent it in a, in, a, in a simpler way, uh, the energy is equal to minus R H over n squared. We don't need, need you to know this equation. We need you to know this equation where R H is called the Rydberg constant for hydrogen, and its value is 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Because we have the principal quantum number, which can only have values of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on, uh, there are specific values. There aren't values of, they are not fractions. Uh, they don't have decimal place. So we don't, we're not moving from 1.0 to 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1 1.6. We're moving from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. So we have definite specific values of uh, uh, of, 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 of locations of the electron around the nucleus. And each location which is represented by an orbit is, has a particular value of energy. And so we then say that, or we're clearly showing that the energy of the system is quantized. That is to say that you can have uh, energy state 1, 2, 3 as the electrons move or electron moves from uh, orbital 1, 2, 3, or quantum state or quantum level n1, n2, and n3 in our Bohr model. So, how does this line spectrum explain, uh, sorry, how does this Bohr model explain the line spectrum of hydrogen? Well, we know that uh, uh, for a quantum of energy, uh, you have delta E is equal to hc over lambda. How do we get that delta E? Delta E is equal to energy state 1 or energy state 2 minus energy state 1. And so, or E final minus E initial. And so, E initial, EI, is equal to minus RH over N, NI squared. And EF is equal to minus RH over NF squared. Right? NF, N final, and NI, N initial. Now, if we were to now find that delta E, which is the quantum of energy that is emitted by the electron, uh, we have delta E is equal to EF minus EI, which is equal to this term minus that term. And when we, uh, and we can actually simplify that, we get delta E is equal to RH. We take uh, RH out of both parts of the, both terms in the equation and actually, uh, you know, simplify it. We now have RH times 1 over NI squared minus 1 over NF squared. And we know that delta E is equal to HC over lambda, which is equal to H nu. So we're clearly seeing that when an electron moves from an initial state or an initial orbital to a final orbital or a final state, there is a quantum of energy that is emitted or given off, and that quantum of energy is associated with uh, a frequency, right, or a wavelength, which is what we're basically seeing in our spectrum. 
we see lines of specific values of wavelength and also specific frequency values. We can actually reduce that equation to actually represent it just specifically in terms of the frequency and that is equal to RH uh, times 1 over ni squared minus 1 over nf squared where we've basically taken out the Planck's constant. And these, this equation speak directly to the presence or the observation of specific spectral lines in our line spectra. All right. Now, important point, if we're using uh, the Rydberg equation, as it is called, uh, in terms of frequency where we have transition from one state to another state, we will have to use RH in terms of hertz. But if we're using RH in terms of the energy, or if we're using the equation, rather, in terms of the energy, uh, we will have to stick with RH being equal to 2.179 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. All right, because joules gives us a measure of energy. Now, so what does that... So, so how can we use the Bohr model now to explain the movement of electrons uh, from one energy state to another energy state? Here we have what we describe as an energy level diagram. And the energy level diagram basically has uh, various quantum levels de designated by the quantum numbers, principal quantum number. Right, we have one, two, three, four, five. You are seeing that as the number, the quantum number is increasing, the energy gap, sorry, the the the, the, the distance between the energy levels are getting smaller. That's one thing to, um, to 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 recognize. And as we're increasing from n equals one to two to three to four and so on, the energy is increasing. So n equals five has a higher energy than n equals one. All right. And so when we look at our our line spectrum, we have uh, several transitions. We have a transition at this value of frequency, that value of frequency, that value of frequency, that value of frequency. And these frequency values are associated with specific transitions or transition from one energy state or one quantum level to another quantum level. And so, and so one can envisage that the, the gap, the size of the gap uh, is equivalent to the energy. So a larger gap means that you have a larger energy difference and a smaller gap means that there's a smaller energy difference all right and and so um, if we're moving from n equals 5 to n equals 1 we have a particular frequency in our spectrum or a particular line in our in, in our uh, in our spectrum that is associated with a particular frequency and we have n equals 4 to n equals 1 same thing n equals 3 to n equals 1 n equals 2 n equals 1 and so we're seeing that as frequency is increasing, the transition is greater, or the, I shouldn't say the transition is greater, the distance that the electron has to travel from one energy level to another energy level is greater, all right, and that is equivalent to the amount of energy that is given off, okay. Now, so these uh, lines here are associated, uh, are called, uh, are lines that are associated with what we describe as the Lyman series, okay. And then there are other lines that, if we were to, if we were to actually expand the electromagnetic spectrum, we can also in the infrared region and the ultraviolet region we would also see other transitions. And so we see the Balmer uh, series when we actually go into the. Um, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see which series is this again? Hmm. Well, we have the Passion series, uh, which is associated with transitions. Uh, the, as you can see, the passion series, the transitions are much smaller, uh, and therefore the energies are much smaller. The delta E's are much smaller, and that tell, and this tells us that the energy uh, states are uh, rather the, the 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 energies that are associated with those transitions are smaller, and um, those transitions are found in the infrared region of the spectrum. And then we have the Balmer series, which is really found in the uh, in the in the in the visible region of the spectrum, and then we have the the Lyman series, which is found in the ultraviolet region of the spectrum. Ultraviolet radiation is a higher energy radiation than visible radiation than uh, infrared radiation. Just take a look back at our um, electromagnetic spectrum, and so basically this is what we're having happen have happening. We have the electron moving from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. There is the uh, a photon of energy that is emitted, or a quantum of energy that is emitted as the electron loses the energy uh, as it moves from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. 
Uh, now we explained, we, 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 we encountered earlier two different kinds of line spectra. We encountered a, 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 a one in which we had um, a, a dark, large dark bands interspersed between very thin lines, colored lines, and this is an emission spectrum. And we had another kind of line spectrum where we had uh, colored bands interspersed with dark lines. Now what's the difference between both? One is an emission spectrum and one is an absorption spectrum. And the difference between both is that uh, absorption basically occurs when you have the electron moving from a quantum level, a low quantum level, uh, to a higher quantum level. Right? So for example, moving from n equals 1 to n equals 2. Right? And we call that process absorption or excitation. And and, 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 or in other words, we could say that the final energy level is, is greater than the initial energy level. Okay? And then we have emission, where uh, the electron is in a higher energy level, okay? And then it moves or transitions into a lower energy level. So in other words, uh, it could move from n equals 2 or n equals 3 to n equals 1. Alright? And, 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 or in other words, we could say if the final energy level is lower, than the initial energy level we have emission. So here is again a summary of w the line spectrum of hydrogen. This is just another example of the energy level diagram and we're showing the energy values. You can see that as you increase in n, the energy values increases up to infinity, incre increases up to zero, sorry, uh, and, you, and, and so you're seeing that there's an increase from a very low negative value and this is in electron volts. This is another way of representing energy instead of joules. Um, uh, and so we're seeing that as we're increasing in the quantum number, as the electron is moving further and further away from the nucleus, uh, it is, uh, uh, the energy states basically are increasing. All right? And so this is basically showing us the transitions that occur uh, as it relates to the Lyman series, uh, the, the, the Barmer series, and the Passion series, and the kinds of transitions that we have occur. Now, we need to f uh, distinguish the Lyman series ver versus the, with respect to the Bama series and the Passion series. Uh, for transitions that are a part of the Lyman series, we have transitions from a higher quantum number down to n equals 1. All right? For the Bama series, we have transitions from a higher quantum number n, uh, to n equals 2. And then for the Passion series, we have from a higher quantum number down to n equals 3. And it's important for you to know the difference between uh, transitions that occur in the Passion series, the Barmer series, and the Lyman series, uh, so that we can actually distinguish the kind of uh, radiation that is given off in either cases. All right, so we've basically gone through a whole lot, and we want to just summarize some of what we've learned uh, what, through these two concept questions. Uh, well, and we're going to start out with looking at worked example 2.1, and I want you to use uh, worked example 2.2. Uh, well, do work example 2.2 on your own. Uh, now, so the question is, Radio 5 Live in UK broad broadcasts at 909, not 9009, but 909 kilohertz. What wavelength does this correspond to? Well, what is the strategy that we need to use? We need to use the equation, uh, which is equal to uh, C is equal to lambda over fre times frequency, and then we need to convert frequency from kilohertz to hertz, and then plug those values into our equation to find uh, what the wavelength is. And so the solution is that we have we have the equation C is equal to lambda times frequency uh, and then rearranging we get lambda is equal to C over uh, the frequency and then uh, the speed of light is equal to 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meter per second. Uh, this is supposed to be m large s to the minus 1. <laughs> right? And then we have frequency nu which is equal to not v by the way uh, it looks like V because of the kind of font that I'm using, but it's really new. It's it's like a crooked V. Um, it's equal to nine, 909 kilohertz, which is equal to 909 times 10 to the 3 hertz. We're converting to hertz here, which is essentially equal to... And, and we know that 1 hertz is equal to uh, 1 per second. All right? And so we can essentially say then that our, our frequency is equal to 909 times 10 to the 3 per second. We insert, and the reason why we need to convert is because we need for our units to cancel. And so inserting those numbers into our equation uh, and not 
discarding of our units because we want our units to cancel uh, a good way of when we're calculating is to always leave our units in our in our calculations so that we see our ca the cancellation of our units uh, when our units don't add up to what we expect it to be it means that there's something wrong with our calculation so here we have l uh, lambda is equal to the speed of light over the frequency which is equal to 330 meter all right and if we go back to our electromagnetic spectrum, we expect radio waves to be in the order of, of 100 meters uh, and so on. Okay. Another concept question. This is worked example 2 in the text, 2.4 rather in the text. For the passion series of spectral lines, n equal, n1 is equal to 3 and the series lies in the infrared part of the spectrum. What are the frequencies of the first three lines in the series? Okay, so what is the strategy that we will use? Um, we have to use the equation, uh, the Rydberg equation, nu is equal to Rh times 1 over Ni squared minus 1 over Nf squared. Okay, and if we are going to use this equation, we know that Rh is equal to 3.299 times 10 to the 15 hertz, and not the Rh which is equal to, which is in, in joules. Okay, now what do we know about the passion series? Well, we know that uh, the lowest quantum number uh, in this is going to be equal to 3 and therefore from this we're saying that n1 is equal to n initial minus 3 and so the other lines, the three other lines are associated with transitions from n equals 4, n equals 5 and n equals 6 okay and so for the first line which is a transition from n equals 4 to 3 3 being the lowest that it's possible because we're talking about the passion series if we plug our uh, values of n into our equation we have nu is equal to rh times 1 over 3 squared minus 1 over 4 squared which is equal to rh times 1 over 9 minus 1 over 16 and so that turns out to be when we plug in our, our rh value that turns out to be 1.6 times 10 to the 14 hertz clearly one can recognize that uh, uh, let's go on to the second one and so for the second line uh, which, which is the transition from 5 to 3 we have nu being equal to 2.3 times 10 to the 14 and for the third line which is from 6 to 3 we have nu is equal to 2.7 times 10 to the 14 hertz now in all three cases uh, if we look at the spectrum we would see lines that have those values of frequency if we're representing our spectrum in terms of wavelength we can clearly see how we, could, we can clearly use uh, the relationship of uh, c is equal to um, what's that? c is equal to lambda times uh, frequency to get our uh, wavelength value, and we can also calculate the energy that is associated with that spectral line as well. Okay, so in summarizing what we've learned, we've basically gone through quite a bit. Uh, uh, we essentially have dispelled the uh, the the proposal that is uh, the Rutherford's model um, and, and and in building or, 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 or moving from that proposal of the atomic model uh, to create a new model called the Bohr model we basically had to understand some properties that electrons would have or uh, which basically is the properties of a wave or light and so we were able to uh, uh, envisage that electromagnetic radi radiation is a form of energy consisting of oscillating electric and magnetic fields that travel at other speed or travel at the speed of light and therefore telling us that light uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation behaves uh, like or rather like, behaves like a wave essentially uh, and we also recognize that the EM radiation is quantized into photons and spectroscopic measurements uh, uh, envisaged through the production of spectra uh, uh, show that atoms can absorb or emit certain frequencies or wavelength of electromagnetic radiation and that the atomic or the line spectrum that is observed when we heat up uh, a gas uh, demonstrate that electronic energies of atoms are quantized uh, with only certain allowed values and that this and these basically essentially which is the basis of what quantum theory is leads to the uh, the Bohr model explaining those observations. All right. So for the next session, we want to explore more about the behavior of 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 the electron. 
the thing about the Bohr model is that it's useful but it is inadequate and we want to explore what some of those inadequacies are in our next lecture and uh, for that we wanted to review uh, sections 2.2 and 2.3 and uh, then read uh, section 2.4 which basically looks at the wave nature uh, in more detail or more so the wave particulate nature of the electron and then we want to explore the concept by looking at these worked examples and reading box 2.9 so see you till then